let's talk about youthfulness of skin or the appearance of youthfulness in skin. What to do, what to buy or not buy as the case may be to try and reverse aging or the appearance of aging in skin or even create de novo new synthesis of collagen in skin to make skin look more youthful. Let's talk about where there is a lot of evidence for certain things that you can do if your goal is to increase the youthfulness or the appearance of youthfulness in your skin. And one of the main ones is collagen itself. As you know, there are various macronutrients present in foods. You can have proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. When we ingest proteins, such as beef, chicken, fish, eggs, they contain different amounts of different essential amino acids. And those essential amino acids are used as the building blocks for proteins in our muscles, in our tendons, in essentially all the organ systems of our body. What most people in the field of nutrition agree upon, and what certainly I believe, is that if you were to say, eat a little bit of liver, right? You might have a little bit of cooked liver, that there's no selective trafficking of the amino acids that are broken down from the liver that you eat to your liver. However, when we talk about collagen, this protein that forms one of the most essential aspects of what makes our skin what it is, which is elastic, why would ingesting collagen be selectively trafficked to the collagen in our skin? That doesn't square with everything we know. And yet, when you look at studies, including meta-analyses of studies where people supplement with collagen powders, and these powders typically come from fish or tendon, any number of different sources, you often will find studies that show statistically significant improvements in collagen composition and skin appearance, and even the appearance of reduction in wrinkles and so forth. So this is an interesting exception where the ingestion of a particular protein that naturally exists in abundance in certain tissues, such as skin, but also other tissues like tendon, ligaments, etc., seems to be assisting in either the repair and rejuvenation of collagen or perhaps some other aspect of collagen synthesis that leads to improvements in collagen composition and the appearance of skin in humans. The basic takeaway of this and other meta-analyses is that when people supplement with anywhere from 5 to 15 grams, okay, grams of hydrolyzed collagen per day, in particular in combination with vitamin C, it doesn't have to be a lot of vitamin C, that one can observe, okay, not always, but can observe some visible improvements in skin composition, meaning less wrinkles, even some reversal of wrinkles, less skin sagging, more youthful appearance, more, let's just call it uh, rebound elasticity of the skin. I realize that's not the appropriate technical term, but uh, the ability of the skin to bounce back from an indentation when you push down on it, as opposed to saying down or, or sagging. So some pretty impressive results when one considers that what people are basically doing here is just mixing up some hydrolyzed collagen protein and then uh, drinking that down once per day or so. Now that is not to say that you have to supplement with hydrolyzed collagen. Why? Well, collagen is also present in various foods. So for instance, drinking bone broth, beef bone broth, chicken bone broth is a rich source of collagen. You can go online and simply look up just by web search. You can just say, you know, what foods contain high levels of collagen and you'll get a list of things back there. Hopefully a few of those are not just palatable to you, but you actually like, and you can start to include those in your daily diet, or you could supplement with hydrolyzed collagen protein. There are any number of different sources for these. For those of you that are interested in ingesting collagen peptides as a way to improve the youthfulness of your skin, should mention that the dosages there come in a range depending on the studies that you've looked at. And the dermatologist that I spoke to said, if one decides to go down this route of supplementing or getting collagen from food sources, you wanna aim for anywhere from 15 grams to 30 grams of collagen peptides per day. Okay, that's a bit higher than uh, what was used in a number of uh, studies, but you'll find studies that use 30 grams and that that whole process can be augmented, can be improved through ingestion of 500 to 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C as well. But check the label on those collagen peptides that you might be supplementing with because oftentimes they already include that 500 to 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. What about other peptides? Okay, so this is a big topic nowadays, especially in the online communities. There are lots of things that qualify as peptides. But these days when you hear about quote unquote peptides, especially in online communities, generally people are referring to exogenously given. So pills, ointments, or more typically injections of peptides that are designed to achieve some specific biological or physiological outcome. And one of the more common of these peptides being used nowadays is one that I've talked about before called BPC-157, Body Protection Compound 157. It's known that certain 
peptides within the gut that BPC-157 is known to mimic can assist in tissue and wound repair of different kinds, tendon, anything involving fibroblasts. All of that has been well demonstrated in vitro in a dish, okay, so not in vivo, as well as in vivo in certain cases, but only in animal models. To my knowledge, there's only one study, and frankly, it's not a very good study at all, on BPC-157 in humans, and yet a lot of people are taking BPC-157 either orally in the form of a capsule or pill, or more typically injecting it. What does it do or what does it likely do in humans? We know from animal models that BPC-157 increases angiogenesis, the growth of capillaries and blood vessels. We know this. It can accelerate wound healing by virtue of increasing fibroblast motility. For this reason, it's used post-injury in sports. It's used by people who want to build more muscle. It's used by endurance athletes. It's used for cosmetic purposes. Anytime people are using BPC-157 for any of those purposes, it's likely that they're using it in part to increase the blood flow flow that's available to a given tissue and the repair of that tissue. Now, again, I do want to caution people that there is very little, basically no evidence in humans besides the anecdotal evidence that people say they healed faster. What I do know is that anytime you get vascularization of tissue, you're going to get improved blood flow. So it all makes sense mechanistically. I also know that vascularization due to BPC-157 is likely to occur globally throughout the body. That also tells us that there's going to be increased vascularization of other tissues, such as skin. So such as tumors, if tumors exist. So you need to be very careful. I need to say that up front as a cautionary note. More and more products are out there that contain BPC-157. I can't in good conscience recommend those products. I can only offer to you the likely mechanism by which they work, if they work. The logic would be that if you take a cream containing BPC-157 and you put it on there, that you'll get increased vascularization of that area, delivery of more growth factors and nutrients, and those wrinkles will either be halted in their aging progression or that they will reverse. That's the logic. Many of the products that contain BPC-157, by the way, also contain copper. Copper is a trace mineral. It's found in your diet. There is some evidence that copper is important for some of the collagen and other elements of skin synthesis pathways. And so the mechanistic logic and the biochemical logic is there on paper. Copper has been shown to play a key role in DNA repair, which is a critical component of the turnover of collagen and other proteins in skin. It has been shown to reduce so-called reactive oxygen species. So it serves as a so-called antioxidant, but too much copper is a problem. So I wouldn't run out and start supplementing with excessive amounts of copper. Please don't do that. But you want to make sure that you're getting sufficient amounts of copper from your diet. And you can and simply look up online what sufficient amounts of copper are given it's a trace mineral. And it's very likely that if you ingest any kind of supplement that is a multivitamin mineral supplement or a foundational nutrition supplement, that includes at least some copper. So it's likely that you're sort of quote unquote topped off in terms of the amount of copper that you need, but very unlikely to be excessive amounts of copper. But if you start supplementing with copper beyond that, again, you can induce an inflammatory response. So it's a dosage uh, kind of middle ground issue there. You don't want your copper too low. You don't want your copper too high. You want it right there in the middle. So when I spoke to board certified dermatologists, what people can do to improve the youthfulness or the appearance of youthfulness in their skin, they mentioned supplementing with niacinamide. Niacinamide is a form of vitamin B3. It is also sometimes referred to as nicotinamide. And I was told that when taken at twice per day at a dosage of 500 milligrams per dose for a total of one gram or 1000 milligrams per day, that niacinamide supplementation can increase the production of ceramides, which relate to the lipids in skin that improve the moisture in skin. And by the way, Moisture in skin is a key component of the youthfulness or plump appearance of that skin. And when I say plump, I don't necessarily mean outwardly rounded plump. I mean the fact that the skin looks like the outermost layer of the skin, which you now know as the epidermis, is kind of taut and the skin looks hydrated and smooth at the level of its outer appearance. All of that is improved by niacinamide supplementation, but that the supplementation has to be carried out for three to six months or more before that effect is noticed. Now, the origin of the niacinamide effect on the youthfulness of skin could also be related to the fact that there's evidence that niacinamide supplementation can reduce inflammation of skin overall. We haven't talked so much about the immune skin relationship, but for those of you suffering from rosacea, from acne, niacinamide supplementation may also assist there. Regardless of whether or not you suffer from rosacea or acne or not at all, niacinamide supplementation may benefit you. Also because niacinamide supplementation appears to balance the level of oil production in the skin. You need oil in the skin. You need oil down in those pores, but not too much. It can definitely help reduce the appearance of clogged pores. And if you're concerned about 
pores that appear too large. This typically happens in the face, around the nose, on the upper cheeks, although other regions of the body as well. Niacinamide supplementation may assist with that as well. There's also a number of people out there that are concerned with specific spots that they see as hyperpigmented spots. So regardless of whether or not overall your skin is very light or very heavily pigmented, supplementation with niacinamide can reduce the appearance of accumulation and maybe even the actual accumulation of melanin at particular spots, so-called dark pigmented spots that some people decide that they don't want for whatever reason, usually just cosmetic reasons. Now, if you decide to supplement with niacinamide, you have the option of either taking that thousand milligrams and two 500 milligram dosages per day. You also have the option of using any number of different topical niacinamide ointments or serums that exist out there. Keep in mind that many skincare products already contain niacinamide, so check the label. And there, the dermatologists tell me that to be effective, the niacinamide needs to be present at at least a two and as high as 10% concentration within those ointments or serums.